I need women to start viewing marriage as a business relationship and nothing more. I mean, of course, it should involve love, but that's actually not what marriage is about. It has always been about money and it will always be about money. And if you're not talking about money, when you're thinking about marriage or even when you're not thinking about marriage, because a lot of time uh, you're actually going to be financially abused by these men because you're not married and you have no protection. So I am not anti-marriage. Uh, I wouldn't be married if I was against marriage. But I want us to stop thinking of marriage as it's like all about love. No, it's not. It is literally a business contract. And if you do not go into marriage with that mindset, you're going to get screwed. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> So I want to talk about this piece that just came out in Time Magazine. It's kind of trending over on Twitter. I refuse to call it in. Because this is what we need to be talking about. In my marriage, money was a trap. After my divorce, it was my freedom. I'm going to cover a lot of things in here. So bear with me. Let's go. She starts off in this article talking about how after she got a divorce, lots of married women were asking some questions. And what she realized was how many women actually wanted to get divorced, but the only reason why they were not doing that is because of money. She talks about this one woman who asked her a party and she was, and first question, like, what about the money? She's like, well, honestly, I'm broke because uh, div divorcing your husband is financially ruins women in the beginning. In the beginning, and that is the important thing to remember here. She talks about how she got married at 22. I'd be curious how old this man was, by the way. But anyway, don't get married at 22. Please do not marry so young. Every single woman that I know, almost every single woman I know who got married in their early 20s, divorced. But back then, she didn't know how to balance the checkbook. Um, I think a lot of people don't know how to do that now. That's because we don't really use checks. She didn't know what a 401k is. I've never had one. I still don't know what that is. I still have a lot to learn about money. But I've always been in charge of my own money and men have never, ever, ever controlled my money. Except for when I dated that hobo who literally financially abused me, but at least he never had access to my bank account. Thank God I was never tied to this man legally or with children, even though he tried to baby trap me. So she talks about how when she sat, she sat down with her husband and then her father-in-law and they mapped out everything and basically set the tone of the marriage like um, the men are in charge of the money. Here are the rules. And because the power dynamic was clear, I had nothing, I knew nothing, and then I would have to adhere to the rules of this budget that they created. And they, of course, focused on her uh, college debt, so all of her money went to paying off that. So she never got to save any money for herself. Everything went to pay off the debt because debt is shameful, according to her family, her in-laws. Because she had debt from college, uh, from student loan, th this man leveraged that against her. And they set up this budget. $10 a month for haircuts, $200 a month for groceries, $10 a month for personal items. And this right here is such a great example of how men shouldn't be making decision, decisions around money because they don't even understand what the hell needs to be bought. She tried to say like, how does that even work? And she was embarrassed to tell them that, you know, it would cost more than $10 a month just for tampons alone. Even cheap shampoo costs $5. And her husband's all like, well, $10 a month accumulates, blah, blah, blah. And talk to her like he was, she was a toddler. And this is, men who talk to you like this are going to end up financially abusing you or just, just exploiting you in general. All this talk, this was the start of a pattern that would continue throughout our marriage. Even when I made money, I didn't have control over how it was spent. And this is, again, I've been talking about this a lot lately. I talked about it yesterday. Women need to be in charge of the money and not just the money in terms of buying the groceries. They need to be char in charge of the budget, of the budget, because men do not understand how much money it costs to live. And they also will blow their money on stupid toys while letting their children starve. I did a video about that yesterday. So she goes, marriage has always been about money. The first marriage alliances between families were to strengthen economic ties. A woman exchanged for gifts to ally two families to ensure the continuation of their inheritance and of purity of blood, which is, ugh, oh, that's another video. And Western, as Western cultures evolve, and this is really important, marriage still is a contract between, but it became about a mutual understanding and affection. But laws governing the economic freedom of women were slow to catch up. Women couldn't apply for mortgages and credit cards in their own name until the 1970s. So even though the idea of marriage evolved, and all of a sudden it was not about just like, merging two families it became about love 
the laws did not reflect that. And they still don't. There is an enduring narr narrative that marriage is about love. Blah, 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 sweep me on my feet. And we convince ourselves that what underpins our unions isn't economic. But the reality is different than the fairy tale. Marriage is all about money. Now, if you don't love this person and they're not your best friend, then that's all it's about. They, you know, like, I'm not saying that marriage is not also about love, but I'm saying we need to look at marriage as a business partnership first. Also talks about how people rarely marry outside of their socioeconomic status, which reinforces privilege and class boundaries. And wealth inequality between married partners overwhelmingly favors the husband in heterosexual relationships which can leave the wife with little financial freedom and then stuck in a relationship that can be uncomfortable or even dangerous. While more, more and more women are out earning their husbands, they are still the minority. Now she gives some rates about women's pay, but she leaves out the differentiation between white women, black women, and indigenous women and other women of color. It is way, 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 way worse for black, indigenous, and other women of color, especially black women. Not 82 cents. Even if a woman comes into the marriage earning the same as her husband, that equality drops off as women age. It also drops off if she has children because women get punished for having children in the workplace if they take time off. And if someone has to quit to take care of the kids because you can't afford childcare, it is almost always the woman who is asked to quit. And that will financially ruin her and actually make her her ability to enter the re-enter the workforce Next to impossible, she'll basically have to start over on some level. I know so many women who even once they had kids, they kept working, even if it was just part-time, just to ensure that they could re-enter the, the workforce full-time when and if their husband ever left or they wanted to leave their husband. So even though it's the wives who manage the day-to-day -day expenses of grocery shopping because the men won't do it, they leave women up to doing it. It's the men who retain the majority of financial control. And that's the key word. This is what I want y'all to pay attention to. According to uh, this poll, 30%, 35% of women are completely or completely or somewhat financially dependent on their partners compared to 11% of men. And according to a Glamour survey, one in three women have stayed in a relationship because they didn't have money to leave. I want you to think about that. One in three. So a culture that underpays women in a culture that forces them into economic, economic codependence and traps them when they want out. That's what we're dealing with. But uh, no one wants to think about that when they walk into a relationship. It's supposed to be about love. And I don't want to start off our marriage not trusting my husband. Stop. If your husband is so fragile and so insecure that you cannot have this hard conversations about money and what's going to happen with the money and how you're going to be financially compensated if you have to take time off from work to raise kids and all those things. If he can't handle that conversation, do not marry that man. You think he's going to be able to have, handle conversations about anything difficult? And if you are too afraid to have that conversation, you need to get help. Go to a therapist and have that conversation anyway. Face your fear. Because if this man leaves you over this conversation, then rejection is protection. Goodbye. So this woman didn't have access when she wanted to get divorced to her joint account. She had to set up a secret account to save money for a lawyer. That's what a lot of women have to do. She was poor during the divorce. Okay, and, and again, this is what often happens in the beginning. Women are financially ruined by divorce, but this is the hope in this piece. Within a few years, she's starting to be fine and thriving. So please bear with me. There's hope coming. Her friends had to loan her money for groceries. Her parents had to buy all of her kids Christmas presents. She maxed out her credit cards. And seriously, all of my mutuals who are divorced mom, they all have this same story. They're thriving now. But to get out was very difficult. She said, still, a few months after moving out, I went to buy my mascara and realized I was free. I didn't have to risk, basically risk the disapproval or have to argue and negotiate with her husband who doesn't understand how much makeup costs, how much tampons cost, how much, how expensive it is to keep this up, which women oftentimes have to do in order to keep their job. And also, 
in theory, keep their trash husbands from cheating. So I'm going into this piece that came out in the, in the Time magazine about why most women, the only reason they're staying in these terrible marriages is finances. So while most women, and this is really key here, while most women who divorce find themselves financially struggling, the majority do not regret that decision. According to one study, 73% of divorced women are happier than they were when they were married, even if they're poorer. And then she talks about all these books out there right now. And I'd argue it's not just the books. It's, it's the columnists in the New York Times and Washington Post who recently said this crap. They keep saying this stuff. These books that are articles that argue that, that marriage is a solution for our financial woes, uh, that women outside of the heterosexual family structure do not do as well economically as those married. But what this often leaves out is that this conversation of unpaid labor that allows a man to work all day. If marriage is a means of keeping and preserving wealth, at least in part because of it's because of one partner performs the function of the household, like cooking, house cleaning, chauffeur, shopper, all without compensation. So marriage really economically is benefiting men. They get raises at work. They get respect. They get social capital. And so we need to start recognizing that when we go into marriage so that you can actually be financially compensated while being married to these men because they uh, should be paying you. Even when women out earn their husbands, they still perform this unpaid labor at higher rates than their male partner. And actually, I have some stats about that. That's a whole article or that's a whole video itself. This is really interesting right here. When my friend was divorcing, his stay-at-home wife, his lawyer told him, told the husband that he should have paid her a salary. He should have paid her a salary. Paying her would have been a way to value her work and give her an income. And it would have amounted to less in alimony. She said, when my friend told me this, I was stunned. Imagine paying a woman for her work would have benefited everyone in the end. Men don't want to do it, but it actually could benefit them because if she has the means to have a good lawyer he might be end up paying more in the end especially if she had a prenup it was certainly a far cry from my husband look at this y'all oh my god the audacity of this woman's husband her husband requested during their divorce that i compensate him ten thousand dollars for his contributions to my brain <laughs> What? So when she told her friends that her friends and her have been joking about this forever, they said, I wonder what my other body parts cost. My virginity? You should have charged them for the damage to your uterus for having children. Right? And having this conversation made her realize in her core, is that what this is all about? Just a calculation. Because men are, men are so good at calculating their own value. But they never calculate the wear and tear and damage they do to us. The labor that we provide. They never just, they conveniently never think about that. So this is where her freedom started to happen. She talked to a financial consultant named Stephanie. Because I refuse to talk to men about money. And honestly, I would agree. Stop talking to men about money. They do not understand our lived experiences. They do not understand what it's like to deal with men as a woman. They do not understand the gaslighting. They just don't, they don't even know what they're talking about. So I would argue, yeah, go to women, financial people. She says, I was terrified remembering the shame that that budget had brought me when she was talking to her husband. But this woman actually like freed her because this woman put things into perspective in a way that she really needed to hear. So after she laid out all of her finances and what all she'd been doing, this Stephanie woman was like, this is so exciting. You are making twice as much as you did three years ago. And next year, you'll be making four times as much. And this is why. And this is what I want women who are like, know intuitively that they should leave their husbands, but they're afraid to. This is what I've seen with my single mom friends. I can't tell you. The, my single mom friends, especially the ones who have joint custody, are thriving. They have more free time. They have amazing social lives. They have bigger social lives than most of the married women I know. They even have bigger social lives than a lot of the single women I know because these women know what it's like to have that robbed of them. So they 
they and they also just have less time because they're still parents and so they appreciate and utilize their free time so much better than anyone anyone I know when I have a comedy show or something guess who is the first one to buy tickets it's always my single mom friends they're there at every show so she says it was a lot of work, but I suddenly was able to realize that 50, because of 50 to 50 custody after divorce, I was no longer the primary caretaker to our children, right? She's the default parent. And without a spouse, I was no longer performing unpaid mental and emotional labor that I've been doing for years, free from the mental load of having to babysit a man because this man is literally just another child, a terrifying, dangerous, controlling, entitled child. I had a lot of time to earn money. And it was now beginning to pay off. And her event advisor was like, girl, do you know how hard you work? You don't need to be worried. You work hard. And that's the thing. that it, This is why talking to other women is so helpful. Because a lot of women in these marriages have been convinced through gaslighting, emotional abuse, and manipulation by their husbands that they are like the shopaholic, that they're irresponsible, that their needs aren't aren't worth the budget that they're so irresponsible and reckless when it's always the men and i did a video on that men will go out and buy a boat or hunting gear or you know spend ten thousand dollars on a motorcycle and then be like wow what look at all the money you're spending on makeup that i need you to wear so that i actually you know, I'm attracted to you that I benefit from because everybody thinks you're beautiful because you spend so much time looking good. But God, why do I have to pay for it? Even though it's nowhere near what they spend on their stupid toys and their selfish hobby, hobbies and their addictions, the drinking, the smoking, the, 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 all of it. So after this meeting, she was like, I was, I was relieved and angry, angry that for so long money had been a cudgel used against me, angry that I've been told everything I was doing was wrong, angry that I'd look to someone else for my stability to provide for me when I could have done it for myself all along. I was angry that I was made to believe that my labor wasn't enough when the reality was it just wasn't valued. Boom! That's what it's down to. Women have been working themselves to the bone in these marriages to these entitled pricks. And really, it's not that they're, you're not working hard enough. It's that these men don't value you or your labor. So there's a few tweets I want to point out when this article dropped. This woman's tweet, it says, teen girls slipping into this trad wife hole and renouncing education is sad because there's a period between 16 and 21 where the trajectory of your life under capitalism is set. And there's a small window of opportunity you won't get again. Especially if you come from a working class or middle class background, you miss that small window of school admission, scholarships, internships, and have to play catch up the rest of your life, all based on a decision you made while you were your pre fortal uh, a prefrontal corporate <laughs> that's a great way to put it. all this trad wife crap that is all over social media they're mostly mormons they're mormons so these are women oh god like when i found out this woman was mormon i was like oh it all makes sense now that lady who oh god i, I owe y'all a video about this woman that woman with the blonde hair who's married to a man whose dad started jet blue and she's all like i love my trad life life and i have you know we milk the cows and i'm just doing meanwhile she has like a five thousand dollar stove she's rich she's rich and i'm sure she's hiring help but they're selling this trad wife crap to women and it makes me so angry I'm not saying you can't be a stay-at-home mom. I am saying make these men pay you. Do not do this without them paying you. Putting money in a separate bank account they don't have access to every month for your labor. Every month. I'm not even talking about prenups anymore, although that's important. I mean, if they get it in writing that they wanted you to stay home and take care of kids and that they will be paying you two thousand dollars or whatever it is i don't even know how much i guess it depends on what they make you need your own money coming in every single month or you will be trapped in these relationships just like 
all these women. And even, it's not even about, well, you, you know, banking on a divorce. This is about protecting yourself and paying you for your labor so that if you even, if you never divorce, you still have money to buy the things that you need. And I love this tweet right here because this is a really good point. Helping people get out of abusive cohabiting, cohabiting relationships is one of the main positive unintended consequences of universal ba basic income. I fully agree with that too. So in this thread, someone posted a link to a really important uh, article. This one right here. They said they know exactly what they're doing, these men. And she posted this article, and it's a really good one. In fact, I think I'm going to make a whole separate video about this. But this, this, the, it goes into like men who, a, a group of men who were actually physically abusive and use violence or the threat of violence to control women. And so many of the things that they said were about controlling women's money. Controlling women's everything, but money was one of the number one ways men use to control you so that you will not leave them and you will keep providing free labor and your body. Now, again, I'm going to do, let me know if you want this, but seriously, this is a very enlightening article. I mean, so is that, that book. Uh, but one of the key takeaways of this whole thing, and this has been written about in other great books, is that these men had to be faced with the reality that their violence and the threat of violence, because that is violence too, was functional. And that is why they used it. It is never because they can't control themselves. It's not, if, if men who are threatening violence or doing violence, financially abusing you and all those things, it is intentional. Men are not dumb. Even though they are really stupid, they're, they are, they are so smart when it comes to preying on women. I also want to mention, um, and my, my mutual Candace who is a, a journalist as well. Um, I, I stitched a video of hers the other day about um, how, you know, Naya, that woman on, on TikTok, was helping that unk, that man, who, that homeless man, who's actually only 46 apparently, but he looks like he's like 70. And he's a violent criminal. Um, you know, he went to jail for stabbing someone in the neck with a screwdriver. Um, he beat a, a, another, a homeless woman almost to death while she was sleeping. There's literally video surveillance of like, of it um and she's raised four hundred thousand dollars for him because men will these men will always find young women to help them and i yeah i did a whole video on that the other day but what candace mentioned in, in my comments of that video that i made is that we need to stop helping these homeless men because most of them are homeless not all okay but a lot of these men are homeless because they have burned every bridge and women have been helping them and helping them and helping them so if they have nobody there's a reason for that usually it's because they often are violent won't get help have addiction all kinds of stuff and it's not our job to save them and what she said is that what is so sad is that a lot of women will will help out these men that we think are, are feeble and oh we feel so bad for them because they manipulate us and really it is homeless women we should be helping because look at this as she pointed out and I'm so glad she reminded me of this. Most women who are homeless, it's because of men and domestic violence. Look at these stats. According to multiple studies examining the cause of homelessness among mothers and children, more than 80% had previously experienced domestic violence. Between 22 and 57%, I know that's a wide range, of all homeless women report that domestic violence was the immediate cause of their homelessness. Now let's even take that further put an intersectional lens on this it is even harder for black indigenous and other women of color for many reasons in this study it says black people are the most likely to experience domestic violence either male to female or female to male um followed by hispanic people and white people women of color network reports that economic insecurity combined with isolation racism which is a i mean that is uh, that adds that adds makes everything off probably a thousand times harder because of all the way that racism is cooked in systemically and and, and then also per interpersonally or whatever. Um, and all discriminations shape how women of color experience and respond to domestic violence. For instance, non-white women, especially black women because of police brutality, are often more afraid of what will happen if they report abuse than they are of the violence they are enduring because of because of police brutality. And then it also talks about some of the other factors, cultural, religious views that keep them in relationships, strong ties and loyalty to their race, culture, and family, distrust of the law uh, and law enforcement. Need I remind you of this woman? She was literally unalived within seconds of the police arriving when she called for help. 27-year-old 
Niani Finlayson. A mother died immediately when the police showed up. So this is actually what happens. This is why a lot of black women have nowhere to go when they are financially, physically, emotionally abused. Because if they dare to call the one group of people who are supposed to help, uh, they may actually die. And if they don't die, the police will oftentimes uh, unalive the, their partners or whoever's doing the violence, which of course, then they're going to have to live with that guilt the rest of their lives because they don't want them to be unalive. They literally just want protection. So this, and, and as a white woman, I never have to worry about this. I never have to worry about me getting shot. And I don't have to worry about uh, my partner, who I probably still love, or at least uh, have limerence or some other stuff with. Don't have to worry about that person dying if he's white. But just in case you actually think the cops care about if you, if you're a white woman, they don't. I tried to get the police's help with my ex, and they did nothing. They actually put me in more danger. So even though the police systemically are on my side and use protecting white women um, to justify um, anti-blackness usually, but just racism in general, um, they actually don't care about me either. They, like, they just use white women to do their violence. White women have historically used the police to do our violence, by the way. But in the end of the day, these, the, the police are not here to protect us. It's all a ruse. They hate us too. Because like over 40% of police admit to beating their own wives. So, pfft. But other reasons why. Uh, lack of services uh, provided. Uh, racist and classist stereotypes. Pressure to keep the family matters private. Fear of immigration status. Which is another reason why I tell you, do not move to another country for a man. Because your immigration status automatically makes you vulnerable. You are trapped because of that immigration status a lot of times. And they will leverage that all the time. Especially if you have a baby with them, you can't leave that country or it's kidnapping. On this Valentine's Day, any single women who follow me who are yearning for a partner and just want to be married. No, most married women are not happy. I would even argue most women dating men are not happy. A lot of times they don't even realize yet they're not, they're not happy because it's been so normalized to be exploited and used by men. I hate this holiday. I have never ce celebrated Valentine's Day. I refuse to. Even though I'm happily married and I love my husband just out of, just <laughs> on principle alone, I will never celebrate this. I hate this holiday. So please, if you are feeling lonely today and wish, wishing you were married, you see all your friends getting married, unless those women have a lot of like paperwork signed going into those marriages, you actually need to be worried about them because most of them are going to get financially forked and they will not be able to leave because men have set it up that way. And if you are married and you want out, please use this story to hopefully give you um, some insight that maybe there is a way out and that even if you end up really struggling in those first few years, you're probably a really hard worker and, you probably, and you're better at, at community than men ever will be and that maybe you actually will do, will thrive within a few years because every single single woman, every single divorced single mom that I know is doing way better now than they ever were when they were married. They drop the dead weight of a man who exploits them and exhausts them. Happy Valentine's Day! <laughs> Sorry, y'all.